So we will start our second second part of the day. So uh, I challenge Ivan and Ed to try to do theoretical and uh, practical uh, one together. True is that it was their idea, but uh, still challenge them. Uh, so it will be interesting to see. I think that it's like um, can be great combination of uh, theoretical part from Ned, practical stuff with Ivan. Um, it will be great after that to get some feedback from both of from all of you about how it's work, and we will try to see if there is way to do that better next time. So Ned joined us a few months ago. He is our sharp uh, appointment um, expert in optical measurement, three five, and a lot of other stuff. Um, so he will start with more the theoretic theoretical part. Ivan, I think that everyone uh, did something in Ivan in the. Everyone that here probably that did something or got advice from Ivan. So Ivan is a senior lecturer here. Uh, a lot of the practical stuff in the courses is driven by him. So he's probably the best guy to take something from the theoretical part and show how it's done in the practical one. So let's welcome uh, both Ned and Ivan in one go. Thank you, Ziv. And uh, it's a pleasure to give you this uh, tutorial. So this actually isn't a tutorial that has been presented at the IEEE. So uh, as uh, Zib says, bear with us. Uh, but what I've tried to do here is uh, amalgamate some of the techniques that I've used in my own research and sort of tid tidy up the conceptual basis a little bit and present it to you as a sort of taster as to what we can do with optical uh, measurements. It's obviously a huge topic. I think we could be in here for weeks if we were to go through ha optical measurements in general. Uh, but Ivan and I have sort of broken it down into a few areas which I think are probably going to be useful or of, of interest to most of you. So part one of the presentation here is transmission reflection absorption. Sounds very simple, but actually we already end up in quite a lot of complexity even with those measurements. Ivan will then take you through actually how we make those measurements. So I'll be talking sort of conceptually. Ivan will show you how you make those measurements in particular using the UV vis uh, spectrometer. Then I will come back and we'll have models for N and K. So your real and imaginary uh, parts of the uh, refractive index. And I'll show you why that can be useful and sort of how I've used that anyway to deal with some issues in my own research. Then Ivan's going to come back and talk about how you actually might determine N and K. And so that's going to be with spectroscopic ellipsometry. And then finally, I'll make a, a last appearance in part five, and we'll talk about something called modulation spectroscopy, which sort of brings a lot of what we're talking about uh, to a conclusion. So I thought maybe to start with, because there's a lot in this, uh, I hope you'll be able to follow what we have to say, but we thought it would be good if we recommend some textbooks. Uh, so the book by Mark Fox on the optical properties of solids is remarkably clear and accessible, and I really recommend it uh, to anyone who needs to uh, dig into some of the detail of what we're talking about. It's, uh, in, in my opinion, it's very readable, it uh, presents things very clearly. If you need to dive down a little bit more deeper into the optics, uh, classic textbook, Optics by Eugene Hecht. It's the textbook I used when I learned my optics. It's a text textbook, I guess we're, we're still using many years later. The fifth edition was published last year. And finally, as many of you might have discovered, that often the equipment manufacturers make it their business to write very, very clear manuals for the principles of how their instruments operate. And this is particularly true in the case of the J.A. Woolham Company, who's written a really lovely uh, user guide uh, to uh, their instrument and their software. And I would really recommend that as a first resource on ellipsometry. There are plenty of other books that you'll find in the library on ellipsometry, but this, in my opinion, would be a very good one to start with. <clears throat> so let's start. <clears throat> 
Just how hard could this possibly be? Transmission, absorption and reflection. The diagram on the left shows, you know, a rectangle. We've got some light that's impinging on it from above and some of that light's being reflected, some of it's being transmitted. So these are the two properties that we in principle could measure. And if we think about the conservation of energy, whatever isn't reflected or transmitted, transmitted is got, has got to be absorbed. Energy can't just vanish. So the conservation of energy leads us to our first little equation that transmission plus absorption plus uh, reflection must equal one. And I'm sure we would all agree on, on that. If my last slide challenges you a bit on this, on this uh, concept of conservation of energy. So, you know, that might seem obvious to us now, but I'm going to explain briefly to you a little uh, nuance which, uh, uh, at least it surprised me. Let's leave, leave it at that. So let's dig a little bit deeper just into absorption, just for a, for a minute. You're probably very familiar with something called the Beer-Lambert law, and that simply says that the intensity of a beam will be attenuated exponentially as that beam propagates through the material. So you have this expression I equals I naught, and then exponential minus alpha Z, where alpha is your absorption coefficient and Z is the distance you run into the material. And so I've just plotted that out for you. Of course, it uh, starts at unity if we're plotting I upon I naught, and it will decay exponentially as we proceed into the material. And so the first classic undergraduate error which, everybody, which uh, students make is they sort of take E to the minus alpha z and say, oh yes, that's my absorption. No, it's not, that's your transmission. Your absorption is one minus that. Okay, so uh, at the bottom I've just written down a very simple term to say, okay, the amount of light that's going to be absorbed if I'm going to go through some thickness z is going to be one minus e to the minus alpha z. Okay, so far so, so, so good. So then we move on, and as is so often the way, something that's as simple as transmission, reflection, and absorption ends up becoming more complicated. So I thought I'd have a slide on terminology. If we've got a homogeneous material, so that is just a slab of something, and I'm measuring the reflection off that slab of something, I call that reflectivity, and it would have some transmission, and I could define something like an absorption coefficient that has some units. So in my presentation, I'm choosing to plot my absorb or to express my absorption coefficient in terms of inverse centimeters. If we have an inhomogeneous material, so I've, I mean, this is, uh, my fonts aren't working here. They're supposed to be a zoo in there inside my material. That's just something that's very complicated. Okay, so only the monkey's showing, but there's supposed to be a giraffe and a lizard or something there as well. So the point is, is that if you've got something, some structured material, a stack of materials, whatever, and you're just measuring the reflectance, that's just the measurement. That's just saying, I am interested in what is propagating the energy that's propagating off this surface, and we call that the reflectance. And we can talk about transmission, transmittance, and we can talk about absorbance. Now, be careful, because if you march into a chemistry department, it's very likely that they will define their so-called absorbance uh, in, as i to the i naught times 10 to the power of minus A, where A is your absorbance, okay? Whereas typically in physical sciences, uh, we use the uh, natural logarithm, we use E. So be careful, if you're using some uh, instrument, something that's commercial and it's got some built-in parameters, just make sure that you're using, that you're taking care of the units and also that you've got the base of basically the definition of your absorbance correct, because some people use base 10, some people use base E. So I think probably every researcher who's uh, 
uh, measured absorbance or used absorbance has fallen foul of this at some point. So absorbance itself is dimensionless, but we can obviously calculate it in different ways. So if I want to use an absorption coefficient, then it's just alpha z. And if I'm more chemically minded, and some of you may, be, may have done chemistry degrees in the past, then of course you can uh, define your absorbance in terms of useful parameters like your molar extinction coefficient, which might have units of per mole per centimetre, and molar concentration. Okay, so uh, we can define our absorbance in whatever way is convenient for us, but I guess my advice at this point is pay attention to the unit and pay attention to the base because these two may well uh, make what seems like a very simple measurement uh, turn into something that's a bit more complicated. So moving on, reflection and refraction. I show you this really just to get, get you all warmed up. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the notion of uh, reflection, refraction, uh, at an interface, say air into water or air into glass. Uh, so we obviously have an instant beam, uh, instant with some angle uh, theta one, and it's going to be reflected off the surface. And that's, uh, I'm, I've got a sort of relatively general example here. I've got something with some refractive index n1, and my light is propagating at some speed v1. Of course, if this is air, I would say n1 is is 1 and v1 would be the speed of light. And so then inside the material I would have some refractive index which is higher than 1 or different to 1 and uh, that would be n2 and I would expect my beam to travel more slowly through that. It would be traveling at some speed v2. And so you can show, uh, you can prove Snell's law that uh, allows us to uh, to write that n1 sine theta1 is equal to n2 sine theta2, and from that I can establish what the internal angle theta2 would be for a beam that's instant on my, on my material. And so this is, I think, how most of us have approached the idea of refractive index. The refractive index just being, uh, as I've written at the top, the ratio of the speed of light and the actual velocity of the light in the medium. This is what we get taught at high school. This is probably what you were taught as an undergraduate. And of course, it's true. But if we're going to go further, we need to uh, dig a little bit deeper and acknowledge that light doesn't just propagate in materials. It also uh, is attenuated. And so for that, we need to introduce something called the complex refractive index. And so to introduce you to this idea, I just want to step back and say, OK, I've got at the top a propagating wave. So I'm, my aim here isn't to sort of uh, confuse you with maths, but hopefully this, this isn't particularly, particularly challenging. So here I have uh, an electric field, and it depends on position and time. And so here I've got just got some amplitude for that field uh, here, epsilon naught, and then it's e to the i uh, kz minus omega t. Okay, so I've got a complex exponential here, and the k, and I should emphasize this, the k at this point is the wave vector of uh, for my wave. So just to remind you what we mean by the wave vector, that's 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And so if I'm propagating in some uh, non-unity refractive index, then it's wavelength divided by n. Or if you prefer, it's n omega upon c. So this is just characterizing my, my wave. Now, our refractive index here I'm proposing, or rather defining, as a complex quantity. And so I've put a little hat on the top of this to remind us that this is a complex quantity. So whenever you see hats in my presentation, or tildes rather, uh, that's, that's reminding us that that's a complex qu quantity. So here I've got the real part of my refractive index, which is just n, and then I've got i, and then this is not the wave vector, this is kappa. This is uh, the uh, extinction coefficient. So 
This then means I can write down my wave vector here, k, in terms of my complex refractive index. So all I'm doing is exactly what I had up there. It's just I'm being a little bit more specific about this. I'm saying that I now have my complex refractive index multiplied by omega, which is my angular frequency divided by c. I'm going to expand that for you just to make it easy here. Then what I'm going to do is substitute that into my propagating uh, wave here. And what do I get? What I get, after a little bit of algebra, here I have my field amplitude again, and I have an exponentially decaying wave according to kappa. And OK, there's an omega in here too. Uh, and here's uh, z, my position. And then here I've got my sort of uh, oscillatory part of my, of my wave. So my wave is going to carry on propagating, but it's also going to decay exponentially uh, with, this, with this term here. And so we can now see that this idea of using a complex refractive index allows it to have waves that propagate and which are attenuated. And we can, with a little bit more algebra, uh, if we say, OK, well, we know that the intensity of light is uh, the electric field squared. So um, uh, these complex uh, quant quantities, so it's the field and its complex conjugate. And so if I perform that uh, calculation, I, can, I then have something which I can compare with uh, my Beer-Lambert law, and I can very easily then uh, relate the absorption coefficient here, alpha, with kappa. So when you see an absorption coefficient, we can relate that to this complex component of the refractive index, kappa, very easily. And these are just the expressions we use to do that. So I'm not here to sort of give you detailed derivations. Mark Fox's book is very good at this. But what I do want to establish at this point is that if I know my absorption coefficient, then I know the complex component of my refractive index. Or vice versa. If I've done some ellipsometry and I know what kappa is, then I can work out what the absorption coefficient is. These two quantities, of course, are not the same. We see that on the screen. There's a frequency dependency, or if you prefer, a wavelength dependency. But uh, th you're effectively expressing the same uh, quantity. Now, we need to go one, well, a few steps further. If we start from Maxwell's equations, we establish a quantity called the relative permittivity. And I've put in brackets at the top dielectric in an inverted commas constant, because this is the term that many people call this. I personally don't like the term dielectric constant, because uh, it doesn't just relate to dielectrics, and it certainly isn't constant. So uh, relative permittivity, although that's an awkward word to say, is much more accurate. So from Maxwell's equations, we can show that the real part of the refractive index n is equal to the square root of this thing called the uh, relative permittivity epsilon r. OK, so epsilon r is just this ratio. I guess we call it relative because this is the permittivity uh, epsilon, and we divide it by uh, the permittivity free space here, epsilon 0, so it's the relative permittivity. Now, we can equivalently, and it's often useful, to express uh, this relative permittivity in terms of real and a complex component. Uh, my purpose of showing you this is simply because there are times when we will uh, express the optical properties of a material in terms of this epsilon 1, epsilon 2, the real and complex parts of the relative permittivity. And there are times when we will use n and k, uh, which are the real and complex parts of the refractive index. And my purpose on this slide is just to show you that these are effectively the same quantities, but just expressed differently. So, for example, I mean, uh, we can work through a little bit of maths here. I don't want to torture you. But uh, here we, uh, just by defining epsilon r as epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2, we can show that n, the real part of our refractive index, is given by this expression, which contains both epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, and similarly for kappa.
And in the case when kappa is small, and life becomes very much easier in optical world when kappa is small, so that's when you have mainly a dielectric material, there's very little absorption, then these uh, qu quantities collapse to something uh, quite manageable. But what, the, what I really want you to take away from this is that if you see epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, you're looking at the same quantities as N and, and, uh, and kappa. It's just they've, they've been transformed uh, into a different quantity. So what can we do with all this? Well, the first useful thing you could do is uh, de determine what the reflection might be from a surface. And so here I'm showing you the Fresnel equations for reflection. So let's just have a look at this. This is something that is often derived in undergraduate uh, uh, courses. So we have, we have to acknowledge that we've got two polariz polarizations of light. And here I'm choosing to call them S polarized and P polarized. And so this little diagram here shows us what, what we mean by S polarized. It's simply the polarization of the electric field when it's incident onto the uh, on, onto the surface. So if I'm interested in the S polarized re reflection, that's going to uh, be given by this expression here, where my terms are the complex refractive index uh, for the material from which the, the wave's incident, which is here N1, and then uh, the complex refra uh, refractive index for the material which is the waves reflecting off here, which would be N2, and then I've got my angle of instance, the theta i. And so if I know those three quantities, I can calculate a coefficient. Now this is a complex quantity, Rs, or it may be a complex qu quantity, for the reflection of S-polarized light. And similarly, I have the reflection for P-polarized light. And if I want the actual reflectance, that's going to be Rs and Rp, which is then just the modulus of Rs squared or the modulus of Rp squared. And if I want the reflection for, sort of, for, you know, for both polarizations, then it's just the average of these two. So here, once again, I would give you a word of caution. If you poke about on the internet, you will find convenient web pages that say, oh yes, a Fresnel reflection calculator, and it will ask you for a refractive index, n, and you will type in some number, and out will come an answer. And that works fine, so long as you are dealing with dielectric materials. In other words, the refractive indices are real. And in that case, the life is relatively simple, because you can just say, OK, I've got air, and I've got glass glass or a refractive index of 1.5 and I can then just put n1 equals 1 and n2 equals 1.5. No problem. The Fresnel equations will work perfectly for you. As soon as you have materials which are absorbing, dissipative, then of course remember I put those little tildes on the refractive indices for a good reason because then we've got complex refractive indices. And so then you need to, uh, it's not difficult, but you have to work uh, through uh, a few complex numbers, and S and P will be complex quantities. So I t tell you this because when you do this, if, if you're ever interested in making this calculation, there are some websites which are perfectly OK, but they don't explain to you that you're dealing with a dielectric, uh, that they're assuming from the outset that you're dealing with a dielectric material which has just a real refractive index. So I thought it'd be useful to look at some, look at some uh, example data here. And maybe let's start on the top left, which is the N and K data for gold. And uh, we have in orange is the K data. So remember, K is associated with absorption, 
and n, which is our refractive index. And we see that n starts uh, sort of around about 400 nanometers, uh, somewhat above one, and then drops below one as we move into longer wavelengths. And k uh, goes up quite sharply. Now, if we now look at the re reflectivity for gold, and I've done this for a few different, uh, I've done the calculation for a few different angles of in incidence. What we see is that gold isn't terribly reflective until we get to about 500 nanometers, and then it becomes quite reflective. And so I've just shown you, I mean, you all know what gold looks like, but I've shown you sort of, you know, a little bit of gold there, because we can do some spectroscopy right now just by looking at gold. Okay, gold, we tend to say, okay, metals are good reflectors. Yes, gold is a good reflector, but gold is also yellow. So that's telling us that something interesting is happening to the blue light. It's reflecting, uh, you know, red light, maybe sort of orangey yellow light, but not uh, blue light. So let's just go back at the, and have a look at the N and K data again. Remember that light is propagating in air, refractive index one. And if I have a material which also has a refractive index close to one, then that light will enter into that material, won't be reflected terribly strongly. So we see that N is, starts slightly above one, but that light's actually gonna penetrate into the gold and metals have extraordinarily high absorption coefficients. So, I've, so on the bottom left, I've plotted the absorption coefficient for gold. And uh, the scale starts at zero, but you see that the absorption coefficient for gold is high. So what's actually happening here is at a long, sorry, short wavelengths, light isn't being reflected, it's actually being absorbed in the gold. And the reason for this is there's a little interband transition that sits uh, close to 500, 500 nan nanometers. But once I go to wavelengths that are uh, longer than 600, 500, 600 nanometers, gold becomes strongly reflecting. And so I, uh, although gold would absorb light if the light entered inside the gold, it doesn't. It gets reflected off immediately from the surface. So that's therefore the, the reason, if you like, why gold is this uh, sort of yellowy, yellowy color that we're familiar with. What else can we see from this? What we can see is that, uh, and I guess you might need to believe me, but you can see that if you go from zero degrees to 60 degrees, the reflectivity of gold doesn't change very much. But as we go from 60, 70 to 80, that's why I chose these angles, we see that the reflectivity changes quite a lot. I did that because I wanted to illustrate to you that we, at least in my experience, we often pick up things in the lab like a sort of a gold mirror and go, oh yes, it's got some reflectivity of this. And I suppose I'm wanting to show you that of course that reflectivity is wavelength dependent. I guess the golden color of gold suggests that it would be wavelength dependent, but then there will also be an angle of instance a dependency as well. So I'm showing you that too. And maybe your experiment doesn't go to extreme angles of instance like 80 degrees, but it's worth remembering that the reflectance of, or, of these materials will change often dramatically at uh, very shallow angles of instance. So for example, I thought rather than plotting the overall reflectivity, I thought I'd just separate the S and P polarized components to show that at at uh, wavelengths below 500 nanometers, gold is actually quite strongly polarizing in its reflection. So you will get a uh, you know, strong S-polarized reflection, but uh, not a great deal of P-polarized ref reflection at short wavelengths. But at long wavelengths, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't polarize the light greatly. Just for fun, I thought I'd extend this in, into the, into the mid-infrared. And so, you know, if you've got the optical uh, constants for, for gold, we can see that, that the story that, uh, that was established at sort of visible wavelengths, if you like, extends out 
to much longer wave wavelengths. Here we're taking the data all the way out to 12 microns. You can see the refractive index climbs gradually. Uh, K, our extinction co coefficient, uh, goes up significantly. We can see the effect of that on the absorption coefficient, the reflectivity, and this sort of polariz polarizing effect at uh, large angles of instance. For fun, I'll show you the same for silver. And now perhaps we see why silver is uh, a, a commonly used mirror. So silver has a sort of a similar general profile in terms of its uh, N and K values to gold. It's just that uh, the, this sort of shift, if you like, in N from uh, refractive index above one to refractive index below one uh, takes place now in the ultraviolet, so we don't see it with our eyes and K uh, continues again. So, you know, very similar results, uh, but the uh, complexity, if you like, and the reflectivity of silver is now pushed into the ultraviolet. So when we look at silver, it's just this shiny, very reflective metal. But of course, uh, we need to be mindful that our eye only has a limited uh, spectral response and that if we're doing experiments in the ultraviolet then we might want to pay attention to the optical properties of silver. I'll move on though to gallium arsenide which is a semiconductor which I've worked with extensively and so of course gallium arsenide being a semiconductor has a band gap and uh, it's maybe let's just start with the absorption coefficient for gallium arsenide. Uh, so here we have the absorption coefficient. Here we have the band gap sitting at about 900 nanometers. And then there's various sort of steps and features in this absorption coefficient. I plotted this on a log scale here. And later we'll actually look at why the absorption coefficient looks the way it does. But now if we look at N and K, we can see that N is now high. It has some features in it. So again, later we'll, we'll look at why there are these features here. Uh, but uh, K, of course, is, is related to our uh, absorption, N related to the refractive index. And so if I'm to calculate the reflectivity again, once again, I find that uh, my gallium arsenide is quite well behaved. And here's just a little picture of the gallium arsenide wafer. It's a sort of dull gray. It's somewhat reflective. Uh, some light enters inside and, of course, is abs promptly absorbed because the absorption coefficient, I mean, if we look at the visible region, so that would be, say, from 700 nanometers and shorter wavelength, we find that the absorption coefficient for gallium arsenide is very high. So this explains why gallium arsenide is reflective, but this sort of rather dull, dull gray. And once again, we have the strong ang angle of instance dependency at relatively shallow angles of instance. We also find that gallium arsenide is quite strongly polarizing if we go to high angles of incidence. So that's gallium arsenide. If we actually want to make a measurement, then uh, we could do a very simple experiment. So here's some data that I've actually taken myself. So I'm stealing a little bit of Yvonne's th thunder here, but I wanted to, wanted to show you this. All I did was I took a piece of gallium arsenide and put an anti-reflection coating on the top. And I thought, OK, I want to know what the difference in the absorption in gallium arsenide is if I have a doped substrate or an undoped substrate. I was trying to work on a light trapping scheme for gallium arsenide solar cells. And I thought, OK, first thing I need to know is just how much light actually passes through my substrate. So, you know, this you would think this is very simple. How hard could this be? So I measured some transmission and I get very little, in fact, I just get noise where my gallium arsenide is absorbing. And so this, this is certainly noise. This is because my lamp isn't very strong. So I'm just, you know, getting, there's some kind of offset here. So this certainly isn't real. This should just be zero because my gallium arsenide is completely absorbing. And then at the band edge, it becomes transmitting. And we find that the undoped substrate becomes slightly more transmitting than the doped substrate, which is, kind of what you'd expect because in a doped substrate there's free carry absorption so I'd expect more absorption in my doped substrate. Now what about for the reflection? Well 
The reflection here is a little bit more complicated than what I showed you in the previous slide because I put an anti-reflection coating on the top. And you can see that our process for putting anti-reflection coatings on this particular piece of gallium arsenide isn't very good because on the one hand we have uh, here anti-reflection coating is optimized for 550 nanometers and here it seems to be optimized for 750 nanometers. It was supposed to be the same but you know. Uh, I've got two different minima there for my anti-reflection coating on my two different substrates. That though isn't what uh, would concern me because what I'm interested in is of course finding out what the absorption is. But what I see is that there's a step in the reflectance here at 900 nanometers. And so that's arising of course because when my gallium arsenide is absorbing then I'm only looking at the reflection from the top surface. But as it becomes transmissive, then I'm starting to get reflection from the rear surface as well. And so that's why I'm seeing this relatively large increase in uh, reflection from the rear surface. So what can you do? Well, I'm sure if you, if you're, if you work on similar types of problems to this, you too will encounter this. So I thought I'd just show you a neat little model which you can use to deal with this problem. And it's, it's relatively simple and hopefully sort of, uh, I don't expect you of course to remember any of this, but it's relatively easy to work through. So here we have some in instant light and it hits the surface and of course there's some surface reflection here which I'm calling little r. Overall, what I measure is this big R, but big R is of course going to be uh, the combination of this little r plus whatever gets reflected from the rear surface. So in order to calculate what big R might be, I'm going to have to think about this multiple pass phenomena that's taking place inside my material. So I'm going to define this little internal ray here. Uh, and here I just call it Sn to be general, but let's just work through this briefly. S0 is literally whatever isn't reflected off the surface is going to be instant in, in here. So S0 is what happens to this ray the moment it's crossed the surface. So the ray, if you like, that's propagating downwards that uh, towards the back of the back of the device is just going to be 1 minus r because R is, is reflected from the surface. Then S1 is what's happened once it's reached this rear surface, it's been reflected off the rear surface, it's come back again, so it's made two passes through this material which has some absorption A, and then it's been reflected again off the top surface and it's ready to propagate back downwards. Okay, so S1 is simply sort of saying, okay, I've gone down, I've come back up, I've been reflected off this surface again, I'm ready to go down again, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can define a little Sn here, which is a completely general statement for, uh, you know, however many reflections you want to, want to take. And very conveniently, Sn can be summed to infinity and converges to, the, to, this, uh, to this term here. So it then means that I can calculate what R and T are as a, uh, with this infinite sum of little, little reflections and that allows me to extract, if you like, the surface uh, ref ref reflectivity here, R, and my single pass absorption, A. And so when you do that, then I was able to I was, I was able to cal calculate what the absorption might, might be for a single pass through my gallium arsenide <coughs> substrate and I was able to correct, if you like, my re reflectivity where this is now uh, just the surface ref reflectance and you can see my, my measurement isn't perfect. Okay, We're, you know, I should probably go away and work, work a bit hard at that. I've got a little step here. This is simply because my, uh, my device is presumably scattering slight, slight, slightly or my measurement isn't, isn't, uh, is, isn't perfect. But you can see that this infinite pass model has worked to some extent and allowed me to extract uh, more reliable data. Now, two more slides and then I'll hand over to Yvonne. So, it's worth considering, given that I've shown you what happened with entirely speculative
ref reflection from gallium arsenide surfaces. I'm suggesting that the slight uh, mismatch here as my sample becomes uh, transmissive might be due, due to scattering. And so if you're going to deal with samples that are strongly scattering, you need to use something called an integrating sphere. And so, for example, if you're going to make a transmissance measurement with an integrating sphere, then you would have a light source, you have your sample, and the light that is transmitted will, is very likely, in the case of a diffusive sample, to, have been, uh, to be now emit transmitted over a wide range of angles, and your job is to somehow collect that. So the integrating sphere has this very, very, very white and reflective surface such that you can detect uh, the light uh, that is being transmitted no matter what angle it's been uh, transmitted at using a detector. And similarly, you can do a, uh, do a reflectivity measurement. If you have a light source that comes in, it hits your sort of diffusive but reflecting test sample here. That reflection goes everywhere. It's captured in the integrating sphere and ultimately gives you a signal on your detector. So with this, you're able to uh, obviously measure uh, transmittance and reflectance. Uh, you can then measure it effectively your absorptivity. And we've used this uh, in our research group to then figure out what the emissivity is uh, at, uh, in, in the mid-infrared. So this is, this is a very uh, well, conceptually straightforward technique. In practice, it very much depends on how you've configured your, your integrating sphere. And there can be some complexities with that, which I think Yvonne would, will discuss with you. Now, I want to finish with something that surprised us. Uh, about six months ago, we were doing some uh, calculations that involved looking at how light propagates through transparent conducting oxide films. And importantly, we were doing these calculations not only in the visible, where the TCO film is largely dielectric, but we were also moving into the mid-infrared, where it becomes uh, strongly reflective. And one of our postdocs, Alex Mello, recognized that we'd stumbled across a uh, fault with the Fresnel equations. So the Fresnel, Fresnel equations uh, were derived well before Maxwell's equations. And they're perfectly correct in the case of dielectrics. And I've gone so far as to show you graphs which I've calculated for reflection from a surface of gold, which is also perfectly valid. However, there are occasions where the Fresnel equations fail. And this, quite astonishingly to us anyway, has only just been recognized. So your choice is this. If you do the calculation, and admittedly, these, these are slightly unusual situations. If you have light that's propagating, say from gold into glass, then you say, OK, so here is my refractive index for, for the uh, material of incidence, which in this case is gold. So this is complex because gold is strongly absorbing. So here we have a, a, a large uh, com complex quantity, and here's glass, 1.5. The reflection comes out OK. So the reflection calculation with Fresnel equations is fine. The transmission, however, is 8. So that's saying you're getting a ton of energy coming out of this somewhere. And, you know, so the Fresnel equations basically don't uh, obey conservation of energy. And so in this very nice paper, which, which we subsequently discovered, because you could imagine this, this caused some, some distress, uh, we found that, yes, indeed, it's recently been recognized that uh, the Fresnel equations need to be corrected by this term delta. And with the correction, which enforces energy conservation on the Fresnel equations. So you follow much of the usual derivation for the Fresnel equations, but you enforce energy conservation, and then, and then you get a value for the transmission. And so R and, trend and this sort of uh, curly T here on the right really do add up to 1. And so you see that uh, the correction's quite large for gold to glass, gold to silver. Again, there's uh, 
uh, negative correction, sodium to air is a particularly good example. If you do, uh, you know, sort of glass to air, you find that the correction is some of the order of 10 to the minus 5. So most of the time you won't notice this. And if your job is to look at, you know, dielectric stacks, don't worry, you don't need to worry about this. But if you are using thin metal layers, then you're going to want to follow uh, these corrected Fresnel equations that have surprisingly recently been established. So, I mean, Fresnel did his work almost 200 years ago. Maxwell wrote down his equations sort of, I guess, 150 years ago. Generations of us have all studied optics, and now we find that there's a little nuance in the Fresnel equations that needs some attention. So, I'll leave you with that and pass over to Yvonne uh, to tell you about the uh, first part of optical measurements.